Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so welcome, Saul Pulmeter, 2011 Nobel Laureate in Physics. And welcome, everybody from all over Latin America and the Caribbean. It's simply so exciting to have everybody together. An enormous amount of work has gone into reaching this point with the um, the various Academy of, of Sciences in the different countries selecting you and congratulations on being selected and thank you to them for selecting you and thank you for you to, for being here. So this is your chance to chat with Saul about this broad theme, United by Science, how to make scientists most effective, how to make science most effective. Uh, actually, Saul, everybody's introducing where they come from, but where are you sitting now? Tell us. <laughs> So I'm, uh, I'm here in my home in Berkeley, California, and I, uh, I usually work at the university here at uh, the University of California, Berkeley, and at the uh, National Laboratory, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory here in Berkeley. Thank you. And, uh, and is, th is this your regular spot for doing Zoom calls from, where you're sitting right now? By, by now, this has become the tradition for, uh, for this, this last year or two. Um, as, as, you know, so if you, if you see, see me in, in other presentations, um, you might recognize the background uh, window. Yeah. yeah, it's funny now, because when one joins a call, People always say, well, why have you moved? What have you done? What, what's that new thing you've <laughs> exactly. put behind you? It's, it's all quite intrusive, really. Yes, okay. So, okay, over to Luis for his question, please. Okay, hello, everybody. My name is Luis Alfredo Jack Mendez, and I'm from Guatemala, and I am about to finish my undergraduate degree in physics. And uh, here is my question. Um, the, the question is, of course, uh, for Sao and for everybody who would like to, to give a comment on it. The question says the following. What will be the consequences of making, of making the profession of a teacher become one of the highest paid professions among all? Before answer the, the question, I would like you to see it from the... Uh, from taking into account the following points. Notice that there are very important reasons for which of all the different works, one of the truly most important of all is the one of being a teacher. Teachers, uh, which here means everybody who transmits ideas from one to another, form the connection between science and society because they are the chosen ones to maintain with us the set of knowledge, ideas, that we all humans have gathered with a lot of effort over time. And notice that one of the most precious things that we have with us is our set of ideas. All right, well, let, me, let me try um, uh, two or three different uh, cuts at this. The, the first one is that, at least in, uh, in, in my own country, my sense is that um, it's uh, the teaching profession, um, you know, the, especially the uh, uh, K through 12, um, teaching profession is very underpaid, and uh, and I think that your point is you know is very well taken. That it would make a, a very big difference um, if we were able to attract uh, you know more uh, uh, excited you know uh, role models into into our uh, teaching profession um, with uh, by just paying you know a little bit more more reasonably. Um, my uh, second thought on this is that um, I think the the teaching uh, profession, if anything, is going to become more and more important over the. Uh, centuries you know, to come, um, if you think about the fact that we may be moving into a world in which we do not need most people to do work to build things and to, and to construct things and to plant and to grow food, and uh, you know, because more and more of that um, can be done with fewer and fewer people, and then you need to ask, well, what is it that people really should be doing? And I think one of the things that they should be doing is, is uh, inspiring each other um, to, to be able to, to think and to, and to, and to uh, solve problems and to invent things and be creative in the world. And so not only um, do the teachers become important to transmit all the knowledge that we've developed so far, um, but they also have an important role in helping uh, people think about how to, how to approach new problems and how to think about how to be creative and come up with new ideas. Um, and that that's probably as important as the transmission of ideas um, through teaching, since nowadays you can find a lot of the information you want um, you know, in principle on the web, if you know how to recognize high quality information from, from poor information. Um, and then my only last uh, little cautionary note is that if it became the very highest paid thing uh, in, in uh, highest paid profession, there might be a, a tiny bit of danger um, that you, you might start selecting people who are going into it for the money. 
rather than in, into it for the uh, for the uh, the uh, you know the excitement of of of, of what teaching means. Um, but I'm not worried about that yet. Um, since Luis opened the door to anybody to comment, does anybody want to anybody would want to make a comment on it themselves? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, Lucia, you did. Yes, Lucia. Hi. Yes. Uh, I'm Lucia from Lima, Peru, and I'm a master's student on physics on the Pontifical University of Peru, Catholic University of Peru. Um, yes. I, I was. I'm really interesting in um, what teaching means, um, but I, I think I wanted to take this. I'm, I'm not sure if it's fine, but. Um, I wanted to make a comment about um, how's academia uh, going, how's academia, uh, the, the path that it's taking right now. Um, I'm, I'm a master's student and I've been uh, doing research since I was an undergraduate student. And I also have some um, duties as a, a teacher assistant at the university. How, how do you think the evolution of, of, of academia is going since, for example, there are some problems, um, for example, to for students to grow inside academia. And I think there are some other problems like um, it's difficult to uh, make a publication. There are some journals that um, sometimes they ask for um, uh, some a, a payment to publish and there's uh, then the peer review that uh, I'm quite quite sure <laughs> that it doesn't give a base a payment so um, I, I don't know I wanted to ask you how do you think academia is uh, going to evolution on time and how do you, how do you think we the students can what do you think we the students can do to improve this Brilliant. Okay, Saul, that's fantastic. There's your question. You, we, we see Luis working on his equation back there. We'll come back to you in a minute, Luis, for a quick summary. I have to be quick. Uh, Saul, but please, if you want to work on Lucia's question, that would be great. No, I, I think, uh, Lucia, you're, you're absolutely uh, uh, right in pointing out that, that there's, it's, a, a, it's become very difficult, I think. Now, what I don't know is Maybe it goes in cycles and it's been difficult in the past and it became easier and then more difficult again. But I do think that this is one of the, uh, one, a, a harder time uh, for many people uh, to find their way in, in the in a, uh, academic profession. Um, uh, and, and I think that it's, and of course it does depend a little bit on which country you're in and where, and where, where you are. Um, so I, you know, occasionally I, I, I talk to friends in, uh, in, in countries where it feels like they're actually healthy. Um, in, in the way that they move people forward in, in the uh, academic world. Um, but I think in, in, in many parts of the world, um, it's you know, the, the fact that we've reached a point where, where the publications um, are, are oversubscribed. Uh, so it's, you know, it's hard to get publications in. Uh, the funding is often oversubscribed. And so uh, people write many, many proposals before they get funding for any uh, research. Um, it, it, it does seem like it's undercutting this um, engine that we have in our society where if we um, had uh, you know, a little bit more resources for the, that kind of work, I think it would pay back. Uh, and, I, and I think it would be a, a, make it more pleasurable to be a scientist um, during this period. And I think it would, uh, and the societies would all benefit from it because I think we, uh, it's been, you know, every time we, we put extra resources into, into the uh, research and, and, and academic world, I think it, it seems like it's always paid, paid back very well. Right, Mary. Hi, my name is Maria Suna. I am from Venezuela and I am an undergraduate student on mathematics at the Central University of Venezuela. Um, my questions are about your scientific researches. So thanks to your discovery, we know that the universe is expanding at an accelerated rate. But this acceleration is associated to the idea that there exists a dark energy causing it. However, this dark energy or the existence of it has not had any um, experimental evidence that supports it beyond what we can see that is moving the different parts of the universe. 
So, um, but what we do know is that the universe is structured in a cosmic web. So my question is, do you really think, I mean, what do you think could be the evolution of this cosmic web in connection to the expansion process? I mean, do you think that in the future, this structure may be modified or disappear or even turn into something else? And I should ask for a clarification. When you say cosmic web, you mean the, the, uh, the structure that we see in the filaments and, and galaxies of, of the universe? Yes. So, exactly, uh, yes. Yeah, no, certainly, uh, uh, we're, we're definitely already, um, you, we already can see evidence of, of differences in how that structure formed and what it looks like um, that we think reflects the different histories of the expansion um, that, we've, that we've gotten so far. And of course, the history of that expansion is uh, what we're attributing right now to a mixture of dark matter and dark energy as the primary uh, drivers. Of that, uh, of that you know, they were fighting each other in some sense, and as you get a, a bigger and bigger universe, the dark matter and the mass in the universe becomes more dilute, and so the dark energy um, takes over if it is in fact the dark energy. But as you say, um, right now we we're very much uh, you know open uh, in in our understanding of what it, what is actually driving the acceleration. Dark energy, as a name, is just a placeholder for for whatever it is that does it. Um, and so it could well be that it's a property of the vacuum itself. That would be if it turns out that Einstein's cosmological constant is what's causing the acceleration of the expansion. It could be that it's a new uh, field that we haven't recognized before. And there are fields in physics that, that uh, you know, can be there throughout history um, and can cause a, an acceleration once the gravity becomes dilute enough. But it's also possible that it's a changing field and that, that uh, the properties of that field itself will change or has changed over time. And so uh, it could be that we will go from acceleration perhaps to deceleration again. So right now the, uh, the big challenge of course is to try to figure out you know, what tools do we have that might allow us to start homing in on this, this, what the properties are of this, you know, what we're calling so-called dark energy. Uh, and the best one we have right now is to try to study again in much, much more detail the history of that expansion. So that's, that's the, uh, the current state of play. Thank you very much. So, Camilo. Okay, hello everyone. This is Camilo Caballero. I am a PhD student at the University of Buenos Aires. My field is social studies of, social studies of science. However, it's a very interdisciplinary field. And I am from Paraguay. In Paraguay, we are new on this whole thing about science and technology development. So I think this event is very timely with the current context of science in the world right now. You know, the coronavirus, pandemic has exposed science in a very interesting way. We now face new challenges and this is because that, that's why, why I'm here in this event and I would love to hear some specific concerns and wisdom or experience-based recommendations regarding the main subject of this meeting today which is United by Science, thinking a very impact for us scientists. So I would like to focus on those, on those subjects specific from, from this event from Saul, and then maybe, uh, well, okay, so we need to hear, hear him and then make some contextualizations of, of, of his wisdom. That's it, thank you. So I'd be curious to hear what other people uh, are, are thinking as well as, as yourself, Camila. Um, my, my, my personal impression is that um, it's been a, a fascinating year, a few years, um, you know, the pandemic, if it were not, <laughs> If we're not so sad, you know, to see you know uh, people hurt by it, it would be an amazing uh, moment to watch what happens when a whole globe depends so much on uh, understanding science um, and uh, and all the ups and downs that happen because in some ways they we did very well, in other ways I think um, we've we've uh, exposed um, uh, some really big weaknesses in how our interaction between uh, you know, the scientific process and the public perception of science um, works. So, uh, so for, for me, I, I think that it's one of the big challenges of our time right now is to ask, um, how do we do a better job uh, getting a global um, brain? You know, the fact that we are living in an interconnected world of people uh, you know, sharing their, their ideas and their knowledge with each other so easily. Um, how do we get that interconnected uh, uh, thinking process to be better at tracking what we really know about the uh, facts at any given moment, what we know about the probabilistic 
nature of the facts that some things we know stronger than others, better than others. And then how do we weave that together with people's uh, needs to bring their values and their fears and their goals into the picture? Because it's not good enough just to have um, the facts uh, established or not established. You also need to figure out how do you um, combine that well with everybody's different concerns and fears and, and, uh, and values. And I think that that is one of the biggest challenges of our time. But in some sense, I think it's a, a great challenge. It's, it's one that, uh, that if we can do a good job on that, um, I, I think it'll stand us you know, well for a millennium. Thank you, Saul. Uh, Patricia, you wanted to come in and I noticed, Bruder, you did too, but Patricia first. Well, um, hello, my name is Patricia and I'm from Bolivia. I'm an undergraduate student of physics in the university, um, major university of San Andres. So here I go. Um, my question is in two parts and the second one is directly related to what um, the previous commenter has said. So here I go. Um, and it's very a very complex question, so bear with me. It's worth it, trust me. <laughs> Oh, well, here I go. Um, first, if we are talking about how to make the most of science and scientists, it is inevitable to ask the question of what makes a good scientist. This is um, this person who makes great science. And there are two ways to look at this. The first one is usually the qualities that we associ associate with a good scientist. And this is capacity for abstraction, the mastery of their field, creative problem solving and dedication. But maybe there are other uh, qualities that we are overlooking, like the ability to collaborate and work as a group or um, the perseverance with difficult problems. So the first part of my question is, what other characteristics do you think make for a good scientist is that we may have overlooked in history. The second part, which is related to the comment, is this. What if we understand a good scientist in a moral point of view, some member of society? What are his or her responsibilities? So one could argue that a good scientist is one who communicates better with the public, makes them aware of the problems they face, which is very important in a, any democratic society, for example. And should these good scientists have to plan the direction in which science should develop, this is the interest of the groups and financing, in terms of what society needs? So the second part of the question is, is it time that scientists take a more active job, not only informing the public in the decisions they make, but also adequating the development of science itself to the needs of humanity? This is the perceived needs of his or her society. Thank you for your very eloquent question. Uh, um, Saul, did you get them both? I, I, let, me, let me start answering and then you should, uh, you should you know, bring me back again to uh, any parts I, I, I've missed. Um, first of all, in terms of the qualities of a, of a scientist, oops, I'm a camera here, there we go. Um, the, the qualities of a scientist, um, that I, I think one thing that's probably really important uh, that may have been overlooked um, is that for my impression is that um, we shouldn't be thinking of these as the single lone hero scientist um, that we once thought of, that scientists work in a, in a uh, matrix. They work in a, in a context of, of many people. And so you can't expect one person to be able to do everything well, um, that there's, in fact, you don't want to expect that because then you'll miss all of the contributions that you get from people who do different parts of the story very well. And what you want is the ability of a group um, to, of, of the scientific uh, culture um, and, the, and both on the small groups, but also on the large, um, the you know, larger scientific society um, to be able to take advantage of that combination of everybody's different skills and strengths. Some people are wonderful at you know, abstraction and mathematics and they're terrible at communicating. Um, some people are you know, wonderful at, uh, at keeping their eye on the, on the big picture of what it is that we're trying to figure out and keeping everybody focused on the, on the, on the curiosity that, that led to a problem. Um, uh, but they wouldn't be able to do the, you know, the uh, computer programming and, and the data analysis themselves. Um, they need other people to, to help um, play that role. Some people are wonderful at building you know, instruments and equipment. Um, some people are great at understanding what will happen when the groups of people try to figure things out together and that you'll need to weave them in, in like an orchestra um, in different ways. And they're really good at, at, at doing that choreography and that, and that conducting of, of, of a group. 
Um, and then some people, I think, are really good at recognizing um, the the relationship between you know the needs of the uh, you know of of a, of a society at a given moment, and then the um, long term curios curiosity driven uh, science that underpins um, so many of the best results we have, that we get to, and you need all those together, I think, to make the the, the story work. Um, now, have I answered both questions or one I think, question? I think now? you've answered the question about overlooked things from history very nicely. Um, the, the, the second part of the question was about whether scientists should be more actively involved in shaping the future of science, if I understood that correctly, Patricia. So there, there I, I think the answer is yes, um, but I also feel like this is actually a combined job for um, our society working together. Uh, that the uh, that we need uh, that this isn't just a question for the scientists but it's not a question that the scientists should ignore so for many years i think the scientists felt that their job is to stay in their lane not to have any strong opinions about how we interact with with society and with problems you know, problem solving um, and leave that to the you know the social scientists and the politicians and the and uh, and you know others um, but I, I think I'm, I, I'm agreeing with you now that, that I don't think that's appropriate anymore. I think we actually now have to start playing a more active role in looking to see how do we engage science with um, all of these issues of values and goals and, and desires and fears that make up uh, the parts of society. Partly because I think what we've seen in the last few years is that if, if we don't all pay attention to that process, um, what and including the scientists pay attention to it, I think we lose our, our connection to the realities um, and to the, and to the, uh, and to the um, more rational uh, sides that science offers, offers us. And because that's the part that is easy to put, to put aside when people's fears and goals and desires are maximally in play. And so I think if we care about combining that with all the rational elements of science, then I think we actually have to play a role in helping um, develop that, that ability to weave those things together. Um, and we, as scientists, we have to play a role with that and, and help that happen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the question, Patricia. Bruno, I'm coming to you, but Jack Rojas, you, you raised your hand. Do you want to follow on from what Saul was just saying? Please, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, first of all, uh, hello, everyone. It's very nice to be here. My name is Jack Rojas. I am a physics undergraduate student from uh, Quito, Ecuador. And what I wanted to uh, follow up with uh, Patricia's uh, questions and so so answers was, um, well, uh, it's been established that a good quality for a good scientist is to be able to collaborate uh, with a larger group of people, right? Not only with scientists, but scientists, but with society as a whole. And um, I was I, I wanted to go more to the point of. And certainly, uh, Sol, you have faced you have faced challenges during your career in regards to collaborating and working with other people. I would like to know, uh, now that it's been established that it's very important to collaborate, uh, what have been some of uh, your biggest challenges uh, in order to collaborate uh, properly with other scientists, and how have you been able to overcome those challenges? Well, it's a it's a, it's a very interesting question because. Uh, I think humans, you know, are, are so complicated, right? And so as, as all of us know, um, if you want to work with other people, um, you will have the, all the pleasures of working with other people and you will have all the difficulties of working with other people. Um, you know, it's wonderful. One of my, the best things in life for me, I think, are when a group of people are really working well together and enjoying the process. On the other hand, some of the most uh, you know, difficult parts of, of, you know, for me in my career are when people are being, are being difficult and when, uh, and when people are unhappy and, and angry at each other and, and having a hard time working with each other. So um, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's inherent in, in things that you care most about are the ones where it can be most wonderful and most difficult. Um, so I, I think there's, that so far I, I don't have any magic bullet uh, to, you know, to, 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 uh, that I know always works when you want to, you know, to have that collaboration work. Um, but you know, I think the obvious parts of the story that most of us would, would think of are, are all important. I mean, the, the idea that you want to be constantly thinking about what, how are other people feeling? How are they, what are they needing um, in order to be able to work well together? 
um, what makes them feel comfortable in the, in the group and what makes them feel like they have a path for their future. Um, I think probably the biggest difficulties come about when people feel scared about, you know, how are they going to be able to make a, a life for themselves? How are they going to be able to find a career? And it makes them uh, less, you know, less obvious that, that they, they should be generous and, and, and join in with everybody in, in the most generous way. Um, so I guess, you know, to the extent that we can build a, a healthy uh, ecosystem for scientists to work where they don't feel scared and they feel like there's a, a reasonable route for them to go in the future, that's probably um, the, the best recipe for, for good collaboration that we can find. Thank you. Um, lots and lots of hands raised, but Bruna, I was coming to you next. Yes, so thank you. Uh, well, hello, so I'm Bruna, I'm from Sao Paulo. I'm a student, uh, graduate student at INSPER in public policy. And my question uh, will be a, a little bit of Camilo and Patricia. So I will get back to COVID and the pandemic to say that uh, the science and research made at the time was very valuable to the world, to the society. And but funding, it is still an issue, particularly uh, on in development countries or poor countries. So they are still having a great difficulty to uh, abroad and to to be more uh, active in those roles. Uh, so my thoughts is what the government and private sector should do uh, more to help those countries that are in development, and what should be uh, your thoughts on how science could be mainstream and have an, uh, uh, more, more like ability to the, the society, society in general? Well, two different uh, thoughts there. So let me do the second point uh, first that you're asking about. Um, so th there, my feeling is that um, if science, uh, if science teaching would be able to spend much more time teaching the ideas of how we approach the world and how we think about problems and how we look for the ways that we're making mistakes and how we try to figure out, um, you know, how to keep ourselves uh, from fooling ourselves too often, you know, and so, so much of, of what my experience of actual doing science is, is that kind of structure of how to think about um, problems in a, in a, uh, in a humble, uh, you know, self-critical way. Um, all those things, I think, would help everybody um, day to day, that these are not necessarily tools just for science. I think they're actually helpful tools for living a life. And I think if uh, that was more understood as being one of the functions of scientific teaching, I, I hope that the, the, these all over the world, it would be easier for people to recognize that they are doing science day to day, whether they, whether they want to or not, and they are just doing it better or worse, and they could actually uh, take advantage of the fact that we've learned all these different um, tricks of the trade to keep ourselves honest and, and, and not, to, not to be constantly fooling ourselves um, by what we want the world to be like, but being available to see what the world really is like. Um, so I, I think that would be one route to making it uh, more of something that everybody shares, not just a special thing for the scientists, but something that we're all doing science, you know, in, in, in some sense, um, every, every day. Um, now, on your other point, um, I, I, I sort of feel my, my, it's one of these huge problems of the world, you know, is the fact that it looks to me as if everybody treats the world as if it were a um, resource-limited zero-sum game, that there's only a certain amount of stuff out there, and uh, everybody should try and grab as much as they can for their own selves or their own countries. And, uh, but my sense, when you look at human history, uh, is that that's not really the world that we live in, that it's a, um, there's an amazing capacity for us to make more available and to, and to build uh, a, a, a world in which uh, the more you, you put into it, the more people will have available to them. And that it's, and that it's not that, you're, uh, that people give something up and, and are making big sacrifices for somebody else. You might like them to make sacrifices for, you know, right now, it feels like there's often a, a, a poor distribution in the world that's terrible to watch. On the other hand, I don't think that that's the easiest way to get people to dive into solving the problems. I think that you, we, we, it would be wonderful if people understood that 
there's a huge amount available uh, if we build capacities in other parts of the world. So if we were to help scientists um, develop in countries that don't have science uh, funding, um, I think it would pay back. I think everybody, you would see a, a, a world that would just have more resources and, and it would be a, a, a more of a, of a world that's you know, racing each other to make each other's lives better um, and less of a world where people are just trying to hold on to little bits that they have. So my picture is that I think we have much more available to us than, than we're aware. I'd actually be curious to hear what other people think, whether, whether that, that, that resonates at all. Bruno, you want Bruno, you, you wanted to come back with a comment. Just to complete. Yes, just a comment. Uh, so what the government or the sector, the private sector did that you think they should do and then should continue to do uh, during the pandemic that they didn't do before and what the practice that they didn't do and that they should do. Well, I, I, there is there's so many things in retrospect that we can see uh, they, they you know could have been done in, in other ways, and of course every different government did you know had, was successful in different ways and and made mistakes in different ways. Um, so this is a this is something where you know I I would not want to uh, say that I would have gotten it right if I had known uh, if I were there myself. But in retrospect, I do think that it would have been very important um, to have earlier on try to get um, a representative parts of society to work together with the scientists more, more closely so that um, it was easier for people to see what the balances were and what the decisions were that were being made. And that also they would share in the understanding that the science is a process. It's a, it's, a, um, it's a probabilistic process where we learn more and that it's not a matter of uh, you know, telling everybody this is the right answer and forever it's, this is what we think right now, and we're still trying to understand, you know, and it, we're racing against time to understand as fast as we can so we can save as many lives as we can. Um, I think a, in retrospect, and maybe for the future, um, the, I think the job really is to try to figure out ways to get more of the public um, in that conversation earlier so they can help act as the translators to the rest of the, of the, of the public. Um, that this is not some magical thing that's going off in the corner. It's something that we all can understand, you know, that we're part of this process and we're trying to figure something out together. Thank you. Th th this question of the world not being a zero-sum game is absolutely fascinating. Now we've got a couple of people wanting to continue this theme. Sophia Escobar first. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Sophia and I am a physics master student uh, from Honduras. So my question is very related with what Bruna said, um, but changing the view a little bit. So she said, what can the government and the industry do to get more funding and something like that? <laughs> it's what I got. But um, my question is, what can we do as physicists in a country where the little money that it gets, because there's not a lot of funding, right? Uh, the little money that gets, it goes um, to solve immediate issues like um, health, violence, drugs, uh, stuff like that, housing problems. So how can we tell the government, hey, please give us a little bit of funding, we can help and uh, not only give it to health and stuff that is very important, but how can we show them that we can be also useful for the society? My, my sense is that um, it's interesting that that problem um, exists in so many countries uh, in the world, um, even the wealthy countries. So, you know, I'm, I'm watching our society right now in the United States, um, which is about to put a, a large new amount of, uh, of funding into um, technology and very applied science issues. Um, but they, it's very hard to explain to them why it is that uh, doing fundamental science um, is a such an important part of the mix. And that in the end of the day, um, it's often the fundamental science that allows you to stay, to jump ahead of all the problems. Um, whereas if you're working your way, trying to solve the immediate problem, you often, you can't necessarily always do it um, in a timely way. Um, so I think that the translating that, you know, back to uh, the situation that you're describing um, is, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I, I'd be as much looking for good ideas as, as you are uh, for you know, how, how best to tell the story. But to some extent, I think the job really is um, for us 
to try to be to, to get to know personally um the you know as many people as possible who are needing to make these sorts of decisions and have them start to uh, to see and experience um all the ways in which that more basic fundamental approach that science uh, allows um, ends up often providing ways to do things that you never would otherwise would have thought of and uh, can help solve problems in, in ways that you that you that you wouldn't expect and I, I it's it's a hard one and I think one of the things that we we probably all need to do is is I, I'd like to set up you know websites where we start just collecting examples um, so people can understand just by example of you know how do these play these roles why is it that you know, I know even even something as abstract as as mathematics, um, uh, you know, ends up being actually one of the most efficient ways to solve certain basic societal problems that you'll find around you, and you can't do it you know, by calling in a mathematician from somewhere far far away. You actually need people who understand these approaches um, locally, who who are, who are spending time learning it and and teaching other people. Thank you. This is a fascinating discussion. Um, Eloisa, you wanted to come in on this. Hi, I'm Eloisa from, from Brazil. I'm an undergraduate student in math and I'm a middle school and high school teacher in STEM. And you mentioned that we need to teach people that science is much closer to us than we usually tend to think and teach people that everyone can do science and we almost do that every day. So in light of this, I wanted to ask you, how do you believe we should educate the next generation of scientists and what skills are the most important for us to be teaching for kids right now? My, my sense is that it's a really interesting time um, to make that decision uh, and for us to be rethinking that because um, I've been watching, for example, my own daughter um, as she uh, wants to learn things, you know, she will go onto the web and find courses and things and, and, uh, you know, and, and little small you know, 10 minute uh, uh, videos that, that teach concepts and they're very good, um, you know, often. The problem is that what we now need to do, um, if, if people want to take advantage of that, is we need to teach students how to be thoughtful, um, uh, critical thinkers um, who are able to recognize what is, you know, better quality and what is worse quality uh, on the web and, and to be able to know how to find things of that sort. Um, they, and I, for, for, for me personally, I think the, the part of the story that's the, main, the most helpful is for people to learn how science has gotten good at recognizing its own failings and that scientists are, um, have to be very, very well trained to look for where they're making mistakes and that they should be meeting with other people and talking to other people because they need other people to show them where they're going wrong, not because they're trying to uh, convince other people that they're right. And the extent to which we can teach that, um, that, under, that deep understanding of our own human frailty uh, and all the ways in which we can fool ourselves, um, and that our job is to help each other by, going to, by reaching out to each other and, having, uh, and asking for help in not ma making these mistakes all the time, and learning the different tools of the trade for, uh, that we've, we've picked up on how we discover that we make these kinds of mistakes and how we do better. I think that might help us um, then when students go and look for a new concept that they hear about, a topic in machine learning or gene editing or, or whatever it is that they need to understand, um, that they also understand how to recognize better, more thoughtful, more self-critical um, examples on the web and, and, uh, and not be fooled by you know, people who pronounce things as, as if they know the answer uh, to dead certainty. Yeah. And and your team at Berkeley, Saul, is actually developing tools that people can use to do this, right? Right. Well, part of the reason that I'm, I'm so uh, passionate about this right now is because I've been watching, uh, we've been trying to develop ways to do this at Berkeley for the, um, the uh, st undergraduate student body. Um, and so I've been developing a course together with a uh, professor of, um, of psychology, a social psychologist who's in public policy school, a professor of philosophy, um, and, uh, and then others have joined us. Uh, as well as science education. And we've been uh, trying to get to the point where that course could be taught at many different levels. So we've been, uh, I think it's been a pleasure to teach at the university level, and we're now trying to spread to other universities. So this year, Harvard uh, taught the same course, and we're hoping up this coming year, uh, uh, two other universities will, will, will pick it up in the United States, another one in Germany. Um, but we're also hoping to try to uh, develop a high school version of the course 
so that people can start learning this material much, much younger. So it happens to be something that, that I'm very, very concerned about and, uh, and, and I'm hoping that we can invent ways to do this, but it's not a finished product. It's something that we're gonna have to keep inventing as we go. So um, somebody uh, you know, who's, who's actually teaching uh, as you are, um, I, I think would, would uh, might you know, be as, as able to make suggestions as, as we are. Collaborations born right here. Uh, um, Emilia Hissa, you had a you wanted to come in on that same point. I think you had your hand up. Yes, hi, I'm Emilia Hisse. I'm from Argentina. I'm 21 years old. It's an honor to be here. So thank you. Um, I study biochemistry in the National University of Córdoba, Argentina. And I was wondering uh, what makes you so investigate about a topic that is, has no application today. Um, so how do you think your findings can contribute to society? Because it's easy to answer if you are, for example, studying cure of cancer, but in your case, um, what motivates you to study that kind of things that have no direct impact in society? I, I, I do sometimes joke you know, uh, to, to people when I'm talking that, that I, I feel like um, if you choose something that's got to be the most impractical thing to study, it must be cosmology, um, since uh, you know, you're talking about things that are not only you know, uh, you know, billions of light years away, but, uh, but you know, billions of years back in the past or in the future. Um, so what could possibly be less, less practical? Um, so, but but what's, what uh, it strikes me is um, how magically it appears that um, in, throughout history, when we learn something that, we, that we're interested in um, and that we think is, is intrinsically fascinating, um, it's part of being human and it's part of, uh, of the, you know, the, the, the life of the mind uh, that I think uh, you know, we, we all enjoy. But weirdly enough, it has this odd um, ability to, to make it possible to do things in the world that we otherwise never would be able to do. And the example I sometimes give is uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, where you know the the, the general relativity. You, know, you may be talking about things well, and special relativity. And you, you may be talking about things like you know what happens to clocks and time when things travel near the speed of light. Um, and it it sounds like you know once more what could be less practical. Uh, you know we're not going to travel near the speed of light as far as we can tell. Um, and, uh, and, you know, why do we care about clocks traveling near the speed of light? Um, and yet, somehow, magically, it's turned out that this theory, this, this, uh, this understanding of the world has made it possible um, to do things like uh, global uh, GPS positioning, that we're able to, you know, find where we are in the world using these network of satellites um, that provides us with GPS positioning. And we all have this now very practically in our pockets, in our cell phones, uh, and we're using it every day. No matter how unrelated the topic seems to be, it does sometimes offer us a direct way to do something like general relativity and GPS. Um, other times it offers us a unusual way to build structures to understand the world that then become very useful in other applications. So there are many times in which the tools that of the, the mental tools and the and the mathematics that you develop end up being used in a, in a different area, and then finally um, it also focuses the the uh, the needs and the desires of the mind um, with smart people who get very engaged and excited by it in a way that they invent new tools, and so we also end up with new actual physical uh, capabilities um, because somebody really wanted to to figure something very deep out about the world. But while they were doing it, they had to invent something to do it, and that became a useful tool. So we've, uh, for example, ended up um, having to invent new uh, sensors to measure distant um, uh, supernova and galaxies. And those same sensors are useful for medical applications. Saul, it was, it, was, it was a beautiful justification. Can I just ask, in your own case, do those things play into your into your rationale for doing what you do, or do you really just do it because you just desperately want to know? No, no, absolutely. It, 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 the the uh, the way it, it, that you get pulled in to something like to these pro projects is because of the excitement and the curiosity and the beauty of it, 
and it pulls lots of other people in that way as well. And then by accident, you end up solving problems that the world needs. Um, I think focusing people on very hard problems and uh, it's easiest to do perhaps if they're passionate about their curiosity about how it works. And, but that by itself ends up having this byproduct that it makes, uh, I think it makes the world a, 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 a more manageable, better, can make the world a better place. Thank you. Pat Patricia, I'd love to, well, a very, very quick comment, Patricia, because we, we must get through everybody. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, it's a comment very related to what Dr. Permuter just said, and it's about the development of the different fields. Uh, currently, we rely heavily on, a, on guided work, whether it is a senior author di directing a project or the journals, especially prestigious ones, with or without intention, uh, they di dictate much of how uh, different fields develop. Uh, so the question is, should we continue this way of developing science or should we have a more organic approach, maybe one that allows explora the exploration of tangents or the publication of negative results, for example? I mean, my, my personal experience was that um, when I started um, in science, it happened to be a period here in the United States where um, in, in the physics areas, there is much more openness and flexibility and willingness to leave the scientists to follow a tangent. So we might read an article, a, a, a journal article uh, one afternoon and think, hey, I have a good idea, and then spend a whole week working on a problem that is completely unrelated to anything that we were already you know, being paid to work on. And that was considered good. And I think that was a very productive period. I think it led to many um, great ideas to be developed. I think right now we happen to be in a period where um, the, the funding you know, wants to insist that they want to know what is every last hour being spent on and are you sure you're doing exactly what we said you were going to be doing? And I think it's a big mistake. I think it's just not the way in which you get the best out of your scientists. You know, even if all you're trying to be is, is uh, practical. Thank you. Um, now, I, I've, the, I'm going to get everybody in. I know, I'm sure, I'm sorry if I'm breaking up the order that you asked your questions in, but Pedro Tavares. Hi, hello, Saul. Hello, everyone. My name is Pedro, and I'm a graduate, and an under, undergraduate student from Brazil. I'm majoring in molecular sciences at Universidade de São Paulo. And I believe my question deviates a little from those that came before me. Therefore, um, before I'm getting to it, I, 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 need, I believe I need to provide some context. Here in Brazil, we are living under a government of President Bolsonaro, a far-right politician whose base of supporters are in general fiercely deniers of science. And when we stand in defense of our academic freedom, or in defense of the science development budget or against policies that rely on obscurantism, we are heavily attacked. The university is being heavily attacked. Thus, we who grew up in Latin American and Caribbean countries, uh, we tend to see science advocacy as an act that is inherently political. Uh, so my question to Saul is, do you see this intimate connection between science advocacy and political activism? Or do you believe that science and politics are far apart? I think that it's pretty clear that um, you know, watching the responses, for example, to the pandemic um, as, a, as a very good uh, way to fix our, our minds on a problem, um, it was so clear how the interaction of the science and the politics um, made such a difference in different countries. And that you know, countries where, where the science had a, a easy relationship with the, um, with the political system. Um, you know, I think we're able to be much more nimble and flexible and, and responsive to uh, what we've learned about the science. Um, uh, you know, other countries, uh, you know, I think the, uh, for example, our, my own country you know, here, um, you, you, you saw that the concerns about the politics uh, then made it very difficult for people to just be flexibly open to what they were learning about the, about the science. Um, and so I, I think uh, there's there's no way to uh, you know to avoid uh, you know that in in when you when you see it so straightforwardly. Um, now, obviously, in different countries, um, it's you know I, I think people would have said this you know for years you know that that they would have seen it much more uh, up close and and, and personal um, for many years earlier. And I you know it was certainly the case you know during uh, the Cold War that there was you know very clear. Uh, you know, differences about how science was playing in, in the in, with the political world. 
Um, and, and then we see it again, you know, in, in these different uh, phases of our own history, you know, as we're watching. Um, I think the very hard thing from the point of view of a scientist is to figure out um, what do we make, what do we do with that? Because, uh, you know, obviously our, our work as a scientist, um, you know, is already complicated. Uh, that, you know, we're already, it's very difficult to, to you know, to, to construct a theory, to build an experiment, to, 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 uh, uh, to pull the, uh, you know, a collaboration together. Um, these are, you know, very difficult jobs and they take, you know, years of, of laser-like focus to make something work. Um, and you know, uh, they take an obsessive amount of, of effort um, a lot of times that could, should be a pleasure, of course, but it's, it, but it's hard. Um, and if, in addition, one also um, has to take on how are we going to solve the, the political problems of our, of our uh, country at the same time, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to see you know, how one accomplishes everything. Um, on the other hand, you know, I do think that uh, historically that has been the case that over and over again. You know, scientists have had to play a role in their in trying to make the world a better place uh, politically as well as intellectually, and and so I think that it, it, it's that we're forced into that role often uh, anyway. And so I I I I think the best we can do is try to do it with a certain kind of um, humble spirit, where we really try to pass to to, to share that sense that. What science allows us is an understanding that we are not always right and that we want other people to understand that we are trying to help the world, um, but we want everybody to share in, in our understanding that there are things that we, we will be getting wrong and that, we are, and that what, one of the things we contribute to the political world is a openness and a willingness to listen um, and that we want to model it so that other people might listen and, and to each other as well. And so I think that it's sort of a, an unusual element of our role in politics, um, which, which uh, I think you know, may be one of the most important ones we can contribute, even though it, in some ways it's, uh, it's sort of leading with our weakness in, in an interesting way. Camillo, did you want to come in on this? Yes, thank you very much. I think this is what we came for, to listen to this kind of recommendation. So following the previous speakers, I think here we're talking about a science as a culture and a social institution. And I see, well, personally, I see a lot of these considerations, talking about the good scientists and the relation with policymakers, lack of consideration of this dimension of science in science communication, science dissemination. So this is something I want to consider here between you. So what do you think about this shift in the way of presenting science to the public? You, you, you previously mentioned that science public perception, this is something strategic we have to consider. And another thing I want to put in consideration is that Latin America has had novel laureates in decades before, in the, in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, we had novel laureates, but in the 90s and we, in the 2000s, we are lacking of them. And this is in coincidence with a process of the science in an inter, in international context where Latin America remains as a, like, a, there's a concept called peripheral modernity, considering this, the science and technology uh, in science in Latin America. So it's very interesting to see that all of you have these things aware in your, in your, in your, in your interpretations, but I would like to see more this thing to the public without fear, because talking science as a culture and as a, an, an institution, it has to coexist with others in the, in the world. And there are other cultures and other institutions that are enemies of the science and the, and, and the scientific culture. I'm talking about what happened to Galileo, Galilei 2000 years ago and what's happening today in a, more mild, in a more subtle and more refined way. So we scientists should be aware of this in every day when we talk to our colleagues, we would talk to our family, we would talk to our friends, we have to disseminate science as a culture and as, and as an institution. This is my, what I want to consider following the previous speaker. Thank you very much. And, and if, I could, if I could add in, uh, you should tell me whether this would be helpful. My, my sense is that, um, that, science, if, that science culture also has a long, long tradition of international, um, share, a shared international culture. And so the, uh, the tradition in which the scientists look for each other in different parts of the world um, and try to bring each other in and, uh, and want to talk to each other across the, all the boundaries 
um, that, that, that exist in the world. Um, that, that's an, also an important role that the scientific culture has played and uh, helped us um, recognize a certain common humanity in a way um, that I think that there aren't that many other, um, I mean, maybe the, the culture of music is the other one that comes to mind. But, uh, but I think the, 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 those two um, can play a very, very important role. And scientists then have a possibility of helping to back each other up when, uh, when it's difficult in, in, a, in one country that the scientists in another country can look out for them. Okay. Lucia Carl, you wanted to just come in briefly, very brief. Yes, uh, so I wanted to make a comment on um, politics and science here in Latin America. Um, here in Peru, I have got to the conclusion that the government is against science. Um, one of the, the principal ideas in here is that um, we, Peruvian government had fight COVID in a way that wasn't recommended by scientists and all the um, epidemiologists epidemiologists and biologists and all Peruvian science, scientists were asking the government to uh, change the politics uh, of fighting uh, the pandemic, but it didn't work. So um, there's, I think there's, there has started, started a movement of scientists on social media um, talking about science, trying to uh, communicate in a better way science but we're in a very poor country where most of the population doesn't have access to social media or even internet. So the communications is always uh, from TV and there are a lot of fake news and pseudoscience in there. So my question is, what can we scientists do to improve this, to fight this? I mean, do we need to... Um, work with politics, with um, the government, or is it better, if, do you think it's better if we work um, from our own, from um, a science asso associations or something like that? Because fighting with the government, sometimes it's hard. <laughs> I mean, I, I, sh I should, uh, you know, I should begin by commenting that, um, you know, I do not have, I only have the, my own personal experience in the particular combinations of, uh, of situations that I've seen, you know, around me. And so um, I, I would never want to give anybody else, you know, a, a advice um, where you would probably know even better than I would about what will work and not, not work locally. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, in the, in the United States, you know, even in recent years, we've seen what looked like a echo of that same uh, uh, description that, uh, of, of what you're saying, for example, the response to the pandemic. And, um, and here uh, are, I think the scientists have concluded that the best you can do is everything. <laughs> that you, that essentially all you can do is say, well, you know, we have to keep trying to work with the government and, and try to help them understand why, even for all their own interests, um, they, they care about um, a, a scientific approach. Um, but we also um, have to work with as educators and uh, and try to help the public understand um, whatever the government is doing. The public should understand um, what what what, you know, what they need to know and how to think about problems and how to judge you know uh, you know what what they're hearing. Um, and I think that's so. All we can do is try as many things as we can. Uh, and it may be that one year, one decade, this will work, and another year, another decade, that will work. But I, I think that we, there's no, we don't have any choice to give up, right? We, I think we, we, just, we just have to do it because that's, you know, we're the ones who, uh, who I think recognize this, this need and, and we have to try to offer something. I'll be, I'll be curious, by the way, um, you know, since we've been trying to figure out how do we develop this course uh, for high school students to be taught in different parts of the world, um, I'd be curious to know about uh, in parts of the world where there is not easy access to the internet, um, whether or not if we made things available to teachers on the internet, whether they would be able to download, you know, things and print them out, or what would be the most useful ways to have that material available to them? Uh, well, I think right now in the pandemics, um, teachers got the information, yes, from internet. So 
um, in the countryside of, of Peru, um, teachers went, some, sometimes there isn't internet connection, even though in small towns, so, so they have to go to bigger towns or cities, they got an internet, con internet connection, download um, the material and take them to the, um, to the towns, or they use the radio. Uh, there is, um, uh, there has been a TV program that became a, a radio program too called um, Learning in Home that it was for, for educating kids uh, in, in school. And yeah, but it, it is actually here in Peru, it's really difficult because of all the mountains, uh, people have to walk hours to get to got the radio radio signal or internet signal but it had worked like in the bigger image it worked so yeah downloading the the information and having ra radio programs it's a good idea I, th I think it had worked thank you very okay, much okay good it's helpful to know thank you okay um uh well, I, I, I must let other people comment though, Camilo. So, Cristina Giraldo, please. I, I, I will come to everyone. Uh, hi, uh, thanks. My name is Cristina Giraldo. I am a doctoral student in automatical engineering at the National University of Colombia. My question is very <laughs> different. Um, <laughs> yes. How do you see climate change in tropical countries, for example, in Colombia? Science studies show great effects in temperature latitudes. What should be the role that science and technology should play in Colombia, in Latin American countries, and elsewhere the world in this regard? I, I mean, obviously, once more, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I, you know, I, I'm looking to you for your expertise in, in the local context, of, you know, to some extent, but, um, I, but I will say that the, uh, the climate change um, story is, you know, it's another one just like the pandemic where um, I think it becomes very visible to us that our job as scientists is to teach um, as best we can um, how to think about very complex, difficult problems um, with humility, with the idea that we have to keep learning and that, um, and that you know, we've learned a, and that doesn't mean that we can't act on what we already know, um, but that it means that we explain to people that this is our best knowledge, and that if we work with our best knowledge, um, th that's that's the only thing we can do. That we that you know th we have to work with our understanding of what we know today, and we may update it. There may be things that we will learn that will suggest that we should respond a little bit differently here, a little bit differently there. But our best knowledge now is that we have a upcoming crisis, and that we do need uh, to be ready. To work on the carbon footprints, you know, in, in the world, and we need to be ready to work on the mitigation strategies for the for what's going to happen, uh, you know, as as there will be some climate change already, and that um, we want the public to feel engaged that they're part of this process, that they are as interested in we as we are in everything we learn and how we respond and everything we invent that might allow us to to uh, to save the situation. Thank you, so. Thanks. So um, let's go to Mexico. Julio Aurelio, you, you dropped out, you came back. Well done for getting back in. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Julio Aurelio Sarabia Alonso from the National Institute for Astrophysics, Optics, and uh, Electronics in Aue at Mexico. Uh, I am a physics PhD, uh, PhD student. So I have two comments or two questions. The first one is um, nowadays the work of uh, Research implies not only work in the laboratories and in the classroom, but also times for scientific dissemination, uh, writing articles, the famous papers, and getting financial support to carry out our research. My question is how to deal with all, with all this activity of our profession and with uh, our personal and, and family life? Because I think the, the answer is not uh, trivial. For, for, for me, um, I've always felt that the you do your best work when you're working in a in a surrounding uh, personal environment um, that's rich and 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 full of of many of you know 
friends and, and family and activities that are not your, your science um, uh, per se. And that, uh, that you know, I, I personally, I, 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 I like playing music, uh, so I might go and, and play, play with an orchestra. Um, I, uh, I might like, uh, you know, going folk dancing, uh, you know, uh, playing tennis. Um, that often um, the, the, the way to do, you know, really interesting work in your science is to have something else that takes your, 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 your brain completely away from, the, uh, from your scientific, you know, concerns. And it gives it a, a chance to refresh and come back with, with, some, with some new ideas. And so I, I do think that a balanced life, of, you know, which is rich and, and warm and full of, 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 uh, of, of other aspects, is actually an important part of, of, of being a good scientist. And that it's, uh, there may be, there may be you know, differences. You know, some people may be uh, able to do it you know, absolutely uh, focused all the time. But that's not my personal experience. I, I, I think I, I need um, that balance of, of, of uh, being able to step in and out of, of the work. It's funny because I, I would say that the pandemic has made that even uh, um, more visible uh, you know, in, in some ways because for many of us, you know, we're, we're you know, hidden inside the house for so much more time that it's, and, and you become very much aware of the parts of a, of a richer, fuller life that you're not experiencing, and that you can see where it's not actually helping. And how about how about surmounting difficulties? So when and 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 it feel and I, my sense is that you know almost every human life I know of um, you know is is a a mixture of uh, periods where you can you know be focusing on one aspect of things because other things are going fine, um, and then something always goes wrong. Right, there's always something going on in, in, in the world around you. It could be as trivial as you know you're uh, you're spending the whole uh, day uh, you know, uh, you know fixing uh, you know, repairing a car or a house you know or something like that, or as profound as you know watching a loved one uh, have uh, you know health problems and and having to support uh, friends and family when when they're in you know in need. And I and I think that 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 is what makes makes up a life. And, uh, and so I think, you know, science, you know, doesn't remove you from it. Um, science, you know, is, is, is just part of that mix. And, and you can't expect that you will always, you know, be uh, doing nothing but your, your science work. Some weeks, some years, um, it'll be highly broken up with, with other crises and, 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 or, or excitements in, in life. You know, you maybe, you have a child, and, and there's a, a newborn, uh, you know, baby at home, and that's that's one of the great uh, reasons not to be going into the lab that day. Um, so, uh, you know, I I think a, a full life is is part of the story, in all of its ups and all of its downs. Yeah. Thank you, Saul. But let's stay in Mexico, Raimundo. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to hear from Saul uh, about that we have to try to maintain uh, different lives uh, that is not regarded to science. Yeah, because I think some, sometimes when you are a physics student, you, uh, you get stuck in what you're doing, so that you forget that um, part of the, the creative process is to uh, have better, uh, have other approaches or activities to solve them. But uh, that's something I want to say. But I have two questions. One is related to to the climate uh, change crisis that we're going to face, that we are face, facing right now, but it's going to get worse in the future. Is that uh, based on what we have learned uh, in the con uh, in the uh, coronavirus pandemic? What should be the our task as scientists? um for the for the solve of of, for, uh, of the of, of the climate crisis um another question is uh, the other one is related to physics uh, is that if if solve things that uh, someday we're going to unravel all the mysteries of the universe and um, how would a such thing look like Okay, let me let me, uh, let me begin on, on the second uh, the second question first, um, and 
what's fascinating is that we have human brains that evolved to work in this relatively simple context around us. Um, and then we use that brain to try to understand things that are so different in their, uh, in, in their, their feel from the immediate world around us. So the fact that we can understand you know, these bizarre things like relativity and quantum mechanics um, in physics, um, where the world apparently does surprising, shocking things that, um, that our brains are just not very well designed to accept. Um, and yet, somehow we've learned enough how to use abstractions and how to use mathematics and how to use other uh, thinking tools that we can understand it. But I'm, uh, I'm always aware of the fact that nobody guarantees that, that those tools will be good enough to understand everything. And so I don't think we get any, uh, we, we, we can promise that if we stick to it long enough, eventually we'll understand everything in the world. Um, maybe there, there'll be some things that we're just not well built to do. Uh, I'm hopeful that for a little while, we'll do even better uh, by using a combination of computers and artificial intelligence to help us navigate um, those more complex parts of the, of the uh, understanding of the world that our brains aren't good at. But even so, um, we don't know whether that will be good enough. So for me, it's a, it's a big mystery. And, uh, and I think it's amazing how far we've come. And I think there's a lot more we can do. I think there's huge amounts that, we'll, that we can understand and learn. And, but I, I have no idea whether in the end we'll stop back and say, okay, I think we've got everything now, um, or, or, or whether there'll always be something left. Um, uh, but we have a lot to go. I, th I think we have a, we have a huge uh, you know, um, amount of room to, to, still, to still learn and, and, and work and learn how to do things in the world as well. So, um, so that leaves me very optimistic. And then, you, uh, and then the first question. It was climate change, I think, again. I mean, my, my sense of the, on, the, on the climate change story is that, um, that the, in some sense, we now have a huge challenge as scientists, which is um, to try, and, and I think the pandemic showed it as well. We have to try to um, start being creative and thoughtful about how do we engage um, the, the science with the public um, concerns. And that uh, it's not good enough to just tell the public, you know, we know the answer, here's, here's, all, the, here's all the facts that we know. Um, because there's all sorts of difficult values that have to be decided. People have to decide, you know, when do we give up the use of this resource and move to that resource um, and who's going to be hurt and who's going to benefit from it. And so it's a big complex problem that we need to work with the, the public uh, for as scientists, not you know, uh, telling the public you know, that we know the answers because it's, it's a mixture of facts and values and, and, and priorities and goals. You know, if, if we ended up uh, having to do geoengineering to, um, to help solve the problem, um, that's going to take a, a large um, sense of coherent, good trust of, of the people to each other that we are going to try something and we will manage it um, well. And so I think that our job then is really to work very hard on asking, how do we get a better conversation going between um, the members of society um, and have them use science in that conversation in a, in a productive way? I, I, think it's, I think we're forced into, into working on that um, and I hope we're, I hope other people help us that it's not just the scientists that are trying to solve that problem. Thank you. Vincente. Well, um, nice to meet you, Saul. Uh, I am Vicente Navarro from Panama. I am an electro an electromechanical engineer doing a master degree in applied maths. I would like to hear some experience from an expert who deals with the unknown that more than myself about how to face the uncertainty and the fears in the research work and how to overcome it to fulfill the goals. In addition, I have another question or another, um, uh, an, another ask. Um, how can we make science a place where adults, youth and children meet to learn from each other and exchange ideas. So 
Um, my, my sense is that um, any really, really good scientific problem um, is, is challenging enough that there will be some point in the work where it will not be obvious that you're going to get there. That there'll be some point where it looks like things are going wrong, where uh, you know, one way or the other, uh, you know, things are just not going, to, uh, are just not working out. And um, and what's so uh, you know so tricky um, as as a scientist is that part of our job is to is to be optimistic about our work. Part of our job is to um, is to is to be able to say, okay, that didn't work. There's got to be another way to make it work, and to be able to um, bounce back and and uh, and do that well enough, even though some pro problems you might have to recognize we're not ready to go ahead with. So it's it's a very tricky balance, right? Because you have to be able to keep yourself focused and keep yourself trying, and and with a sense of excitement and optimism, um, way beyond any ordinary uh, you know human uh, experience. Um, because science is hard, um, and yet you have to know that some problems, um, maybe that's the wrong time. We're not ready to do it yet, and you have to be able to step back from that problem, you know, and not keep hitting your head against the wall. And that's a very tricky balance. I think this is one of the reasons, actually. I think why um, working with with group of with other scientists together um, can make a very big difference. So that um, a group of people can help each other stay honest, and they can help each other stay excited. So they can they can keep bouncing off each other good ideas if there's a problem, um, or if, if they've all done that you know, to, to the, as far as they possibly can, they could come to a conclusion together that, you know, none of us see any way to move forward. Maybe this is the time to work on a different problem. Um, and, <laughs> and, 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 and I think that balance is something that's maybe easier to do with other people around, you know, uh, help, help, helping each other. Um, so, so that's that's my thought uh, on that. But I do think that um, when I'm teaching this uh, this course to uh, that we're trying to develop um, for to teach scientific thinking, one of the topics that we teach is what I call scientific optimism, and that scientists have to um, be willing to um, believe that they can solve a problem much much longer than almost anybody would be would be reasonable uh, would, would be reasonable for anybody else because. Um, scientific problems take a lot of persistence and willingness for something to go wrong and then to try and recover and say, okay, that didn't work. Let's figure out a different way to do it. You know, so I consider that to be part of teaching science as well um, uh, you know, as, as the actual content. Now, your other, your other question uh, that, 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 that you're asking, um, I, I do think that um, it, as, part of, like, as part of education, um, I would love if we had the students learn enough that they want to go and, and have questions to go back to talk to their families about. And I think that would be fascinating if part of every project had a part, had, had a section where um, it, when the students have something that they think is interesting, that they are asked to bounce it off of their family and friends uh, and parents and others um, as a way of tying together the the uh, the generations in these problems that we that we're trying to teach people how to how to approach as science uh, you know in the scientific way. Um, so you know so much of it is willingness to be wrong, willingness to to learn something different, and you want to model that. and And it would be interesting if uh, if little by little that could seep back into the parents as well. Amazing. I think that requires a society that. Is uh, full of all of tolerance of love because here in Latin America, a children with a big idea sometimes it is not looking good. But I think that in our times we have a more tolerance, um, a lovely society. I think that is very possible. I, I, I think it's I think it's something that we that we really should try and and, and see uh, and see whether or not it helps. You know, I, I think these are all experiments, but I think it's it, they're they're I think they're worthy worthy experiments. Thank you. So, lastly, to Nicaragua, um, I know you I know other people want to comment. We might have a minute for that, but uh, Nicaragua hasn't spoken. So, Luis. Hi everyone. My name is Luis uh, Luis Alvarez. I am from Nicaragua. I am an environmental engineer 
And currently I am studying a master in business administration and I am an industrial manager of a company uh, that produce proteins for animal and human consumption. So my question is, uh, in what way do you think that within, uh, inside of the companies, the employers can promote in the employees, the patient uh, and love for the science and scientific research uh, in order to, uh, they contribute innovative ideas that improve the profitability of the companies and mainly uh, ideas that help or improve the, communi the communities. Now, I, I think that's actually a fascinating question because I, um, and of course, I've, I've not worked in, in a, uh, in a you know, business environment myself directly, but I, you know, I have friends uh, you know, who, who, who have as well. Um, and my, my sense is that um, the, the really interesting, tricky uh, approach you know, in this is the question of how does one give enough openness and flexibility um, to people who are working in an in a, uh, in, in a, in a environment? Um, but have this, the, the employees excited and motivated enough by the goals that they want to use the flexibility in a way that actually achieves a, 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 group, a group end that you're after. Um, so, so I guess the, um, the real question is, can you model that kind of thinking where you are working with groups of people and you're showing the, the flexible thinking and willingness to be wrong, but, uh, but asking them to help play the game and help dive in together um, with that, that a degree of flexibility so that new solutions can be found and new approaches can be, can be invented. Um, so I, 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 I think that would be the really interesting experiment to try to see whether that, that um, culture can be taught in that style. I think to some extent, a lot of it might have to do with modeling it from the top. You know, if, if, the, uh, if the leaders show that they're curious and they're interested in ways that they could be wrong, um, and that they, but that they're trying to be creative about solving it, and then they're looking for other people to play the same game with them. Maybe that would be that would be the most interesting uh, 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 you know, approach to begin with. Um, but I would I'd be really curious to find out how it worked, and uh, and you know it, what your experience you know is and 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 and, and you know can be. You know. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, it was a joy to meet you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Nice to meet you all. Bye. Nice to meet you all. Thank bye. you so much.